that's the harder thing if anything is like not letting your uh not letting like your adrenaline get the best of you because there's times where we would go out and like there'd be like a lot of people or just like a great crowd and i'd be getting too into it and i could feel that i i'd be like pushing what's going on everyone portable trevor here and today i have a very special guest he is in a band called day seeker and he just recently came out the project called hurt wave super excited to have this guy on please welcome roy rodriguez what's up man hey how's it going man uh, i'm good good how are you doing dude i'm having a great day i just got back home from uh christmas so ready to hit the ground running with working and going into the new year so how was your holiday uh it's good man it's pretty pretty mellow i mean you can't really like go out and have a big family party right now so uh yeah i just kept it in my immediate family when i was <laughs> home so very yeah. small circle yeah no it's good though man it was uh still got to see just some of my immediate family and it was cool I, I haven't seen a lot of them since like the pandemic happened so it was nice just to like feel a little normal for a second mm -hmm. anyways yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think it's important to do that every now and then obviously we can't go out and have these big celebrations, but it's nice to have these smaller victories, I guess. Yes. Very, very small, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very small. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So you're a musician. You are the front man of this band called day seeker who I discovered last year. And I, I love everything you guys have put out. Like you got, I'm a big fan. So that's why I asked you to come on. And uh, so what's being a musician like in this insane time? Uh, it sucks kind of <laughs> so, be, like, really that's the answer i was expecting yeah um i think right now it kind of challenges you in very interesting ways of how to stay productive and how to like keep your band relevant at a time where like you can't really go out and play shows so um i happen i mean we didn't time it with the pandemic but like me and uh me and Mike, who he he plays drums in Dayseeker, I and mean, he's he's the other guy in Hurt Wave. Um, we we just got really lucky that we had like we've we've had a plan um, it, like up until earlier this year. We were just going to keep putting out a new single for Hurt Wave like every seven or eight weeks, and so we're really lucky that like we're going to have that to kind of carry us through until like March or April, and then by that time, like Dayseeker will probably have like some some other stuff to put out. So I'm a uh, I'm lucky, yeah, we have the side project because if we didn't, I it would be really hard kind of, I don't know, keeping keeping fans interested and feeling like you're you're still relevant right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, let's go ahead and talk about Her Wave because it's one of your newest uh, ventures out. And uh, my only complaint about Her Wave is that there's not more songs. <laughs> like I enjoyed every song. I really loved Fever Dream. That was probably one of my favorites. So oh, yeah, tell me about the process of making this. Yeah, Mike and I, uh, I mean, we've been playing music together for the better part of a decade. And uh, I had these songs that I was writing um, that just felt like too mellow to be like for Dayseeker. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we, I mean, honestly, like four years ago, we started kind of putting stuff for Hurt Wave together. Um, Mike just had like a really uh, kind of like rudimentary setup with like GarageBand and we were just putting, we, we ended up writing Sever together, which was like the first, actually the first, the first song we put out, it was actually the first song that we had written together. But um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. I just basically bring the instrumentation to Mike, like on guitar and some vocal ideas. And then Mike is a lot more responsible for just like the, the percussive elements, like the beats and everything. And then, uh, we go to our producer, his name's Daniel Bronstein in Los Angeles. And he's the same guy who, who did like sleep talk and stuff. Um, so we, uh, I think we have a good formula there. We all have like a similar vision for like day seeker and for hurt wave. And, um, our producer's just, he's just the man. We'll like bring him a song that's like pretty good. And he just has this really amazing way of finding these soundscapes. And he's got the magic touch. Yeah. Yeah. He just really like any, yeah. And it, we'll, we'll bring stuff to him where I'm like, I don't know if this sucks or if it's good. And then I'm like, oh, okay, it's good. It's just like, I needed him to like pull it out kind of. Um, but yeah, we've, we've just been doing that and we put a little, a little seven song EP together and, you know, we, 
I know, I know it's a bummer, I'm sure, for like a new project where people want to listen, but I feel like going single by single because we're newer, it allows us to keep people engaged a little bit more because I I didn't want to just put out three songs like separately and then drop seven and then like the back half of the EP get kind of disregarded because people are like, all right, you know, like I think it's a lot easier to hold people's attention for like three or four minutes at a time as opposed to like 20 or 30 minutes, you know? Did it scare you when you started this that because you guys already have a pretty good following with Dayseeker and even just yourself? Was it kind of scary whenever you put it out like, oh, are people going to enjoy this mellow synth wavy kind of sound? Not really. Um, not, not not to say that in like an arrogant way, but um, I think I think we we really felt like if you if you were a fan of Dayseeker, um, you you would probably enjoy Hurt Wave to like a small extent because it's just basically like a softer more uh more mellow version of mm-hmm. like day seeker for the most part like it's it's a it's a similar writing team it's just uh i just think some stuff from hurt wave is just a little too different for like for day seeker to put out mm, absolutely what were mm-hmm. some of your inspirations when you're going into it because I'm a huge uh, synthwave fan. Like I love bands like The Midnight. They're one of my favorites. So yeah, sure. and what I love that you guys did, you kind of like you have that synthwave '80s nostalgic sound, but you also mm. like put your own spin on it, like with your intricate melodies and lyrics. Yeah, um, that's funny. Yeah, for sure. The Midnight. The Midnight. The Midnight has been one of the cooler finds that I've come across, like in the last few years musically. Because I mean. Some bands have kind of like minor 80s elements. I feel like they really like set out to be just like a modern like 80s band, which I, I love. And just the their synthesizers and saxophones, they're they're for sure like a really, a really big influence. But we're also just into like in general, just like a lot of pop and a lot of soul. Like I listen to a lot of uh a lot of this uh female artist, her name's her um Kaylani so I don't know kind of trying to do like a weird sad soulful vibe with like 80s instrumentals so it's uh it's it's an interesting process for sure but uh no I'm I'm happy with the response I think I think we're close to like a million streams on on uh just the four we put out like collectively anyway so far so I'm I'm excited on, um Spotify real quick see where you go <laughs> Yeah. Um, I hate that I listen to music on it, but it's just so convenient. You guys oh, no. are at 30,000 monthly listeners. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad for a, a new a new project, but I think like all the streams for each song added up is around like eight or 900,000, which is cool. So we still got a, we got three more coming and uh, yeah, I'm, I, I like the last three. I think they'll be like a nice, a nice little mm. finishing touch for it for people who've been listening. One of the things I've been worried about in the synthwave genre is just like things getting old or repetitive because, you know, a lot of synthwave artists to me, they sound the same. So people like you guys in the midnight really stand out because you have this like dreamy, like atmosphere. That's that's probably one of the biggest compliments I could give your project is it just has atmosphere to it. I feel like I can jump into that world. So how do you like keep that fresh? I don't know, man. I mean, we're only one, we're only one EP in, so we've got we're kind of lucky so far. Uh, mm-hmm. I imagine, yeah, the bigger challenge will be like when we we're probably gonna do like a night because our first one's like night therapy one. We're probably gonna do like a night therapy two at like probably a while from now, but that'll be. But then that's kind of nice because then I don't. I mean, who knows? Like, um, I feel like synthwave wasn't even as popular of a genre like a few years ago as it is right now so i mean there's i don't know i keep like thinking that like (laughs) it's just gonna keep jumping like a decade basically like i'm wondering (laughs) if like if like by the time like a couple years from now it's like oh now it's like cool to to sound like third eye blind or like something out of the 90s you know um Mm -hmm. i'm I'm really curious actually to see to see if that happens because I would never have like imagined putting like '80s synthesizer, especially into like Dayseeker and stuff. But it's like weird how well that that worked when we did that on Sleep Talk. So, mm-hmm. I think that's what hooked me on Sleep Talk whenever I first heard that because that that song is a banger. I, I listened to it like twice on my way home today, and I was just okay. like, "This song, this song rules." <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't. I think. Well, there's. I don't think there's a lot of bands in post hardcore who are trying to be 
synth wave like i don't know our, our, our friends kingdom of giants kind of did it and I, I think they did it in a really cool way but i think it's the same thing where like they they put kind of an 80s touch over post hardcore and I, I feel like people were just like damn this is sick um it's a re- really good album i don't know if you listen to kingdom of giants but uh if you if you like kind of i'll check them out they're sick they're they're a little they're pro- they're like a bit more heavier than than we are probably more in like the metalcore world but they're for sure like uh they for sure picked up like this synth wave 80s kind of vibe on their last release. And I, I think it's, I think it's awesome. I think it's, it's really cool. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I know I, I can't remember what you put on your Instagram bio, but you're like the sad boy King and you just like, you love writing these emotional lyrics. So mm-hmm. um, why, how come, why would you make that your thing? And would you ever write like a happy song? <laughs> uh yeah, that's funny. I think I th- well, I think it's because for a while I was kind of taught that it was almost like a bad thing. Like people were like, "Wow, it's so sad. Like it's such a bummer." Like, but then I feel like it 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 comforts a lot of people. Or like I really like sad music, and so I think kind of as the years have gone on, it seemed like it's more more socially acceptable to like be into sad music or to like it. And so I just noticed that's that's like our bread and butter. Like I think that's why if you like Dayseeker, it's probably because of how sad it is. And so um, I think some fan called me it like offhand. And then I think also I've just like kind of taken social media a little less seriously as, as the years have gone on. So I don't I'm not like <laughs> I don't actually think I'm like the sad king, but I just thought it was what I thought it was a funny thing. Somebody called me and. I mean, it's true. Yeah. I mean, like, I think a lot of the music has like heavy, sad content. Um, That just seems to be what I'm, what I'm better at writing about. I've not that, uh, not, I don't think that it's like I'm incapable of writing a happy song, but I think like a happy song in Dayseeker might be like a little, it could be kind of corny. I've thought about writing something more uplifting or happy for like Hurtwave, um, but I'm kind of, uh, I feel like it would be like a love song and I haven't really like, seriously dated anybody in a while so i feel like i have to like meet the right girl and then i'm sure at some point i'll write something that's not super depressing but uh yeah listening to both projects i'm like who hurt this man (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah i don't know i mean truthfully i don't i don't consider myself like a very uh a very sad person i think it's just uh but i think a lot of it is because like i get to i get to get a lot of it out um with songwriting like i i don't i don't internalize a lot of like my feelings so i feel like i'm kind of free in that aspect emotionally speaking i guess so um with each song do you take like a personal experience or is it just kind of what you're feeling overall like for a whole album if that makes sense yeah um I mean, it kind of depends, like, uh, like Sleep Talk is just a collection of like different random stuff. There wasn't like a cohesive, like meaning or theme. Um, but like, I know our third record, it's like a concept album. So it's meant to like, kind of be a story all the way through. But, uh, but that was pretty, it's, it gets pretty challenging trying to stay to like, or leaning towards one topic for like 11 or 12 songs. So um, no, I honestly will just kind of be like, there's like things where I'm like, okay, like I really think like thematically this could be cool. So I have to write about that at some point. Um, and then sometimes like, yeah, like there's, there's a song on sleep talk called starving to be empty. I was kind of like, Oh man, like I really want to write a song about like eating disorders. Um, and so I had a friend, she kind of like opened up to me about her experience. And then I did my best to try and write it from like everything that she told me. So sometimes, sometimes it's like a personal thing. Like I, I am dealing with it and I'm battling it. <clears throat> and then other times it's uh, it's like somebody else's story who was like brave enough to kind of open up about their experiences and, and hopefully translate it in a way where I can write it without it sounding like nonsense, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I just thought of another question. <clears throat> so so I'm a filmmaker. That's what I do for a living. And I feel, I find it hard to write a story based on somebody else's experience. And so most of the things that I've made have been based on, you know, the way I perceive the world or just something that I've been through. So what was that experience like writing for something that you haven't personally went through? Um, it can be challenging for sure, but I think that's why I, 
But I think it it kind of challenges me as a writer to like not get so wrapped up in like my own experiences. And I, I think too, the nice thing is, is it kind of teaches you to like, <clears throat> to have like empathy for people and like to really, because I think a weird thing is that like most of the time, <clears throat> excuse me, is you're, you're living in your own body and your own mind and your own experiences. And so it was, I think sometimes it's kind of eye opening to hear about, like she would just tell me about how. Cause I mean, yeah, my, my dumb brain wants to go like, you should just eat. Like, why, like, why are you eating? It's not, it's not that difficult. But then <clears throat> she would basically tell me she has like this internalized voice. Like it's like border, it's like borderline schizophrenia where she, like, if she eats a burrito, like her, her like brain will be like, you're a disgusting human and you need to starve yourself for like three days because you ate that food. And, uh, it was just kind of, uh, yeah, I think it teaches you to like really think about other people's experiences outside of your own. And it was cool of her to open up about it. I mean, we just had like a, we probably talked on the phone for like an hour and a half or two hours. And I would just like kind of make notes about what she talked about. And it's kind of interesting getting to like step into somebody else's skin and try and write from their experiences. So, but I, so it's, yeah, it's a challenge sometimes for sure. I will, I will agree that like the, authenticity of a song it definitely is probably a lot more sincere if like i've actually dealt with it personally but mm -hmm. i've written i've done a lot of perspective writing though um with like day seeker records so uh, it's it's not not always about me for sure yeah whenever you guys did concerts did you run into a lot of fans that would be like oh your music helped me through this time or any of those things yeah pretty much i uh i i always made it a point to go to our table basically like right after we played um, just to like talk to people and it was uh yeah that was that was mainly what it is again I think if if you like day seeker it's it's probably because there's like something in there that you're you're relating to or it helped you through something so I think most yeah most of the time at the merch table they're like really short mini therapy sessions where they want to talk about like oh uh, like my parent was a drug addict or like my dad had cancer too or like so on and so forth, just about how a song helped them. I mean, and I think, I think that's kind of the beauty of the whole thing also is like, that's that, like, I, I didn't have an awesome upbringing with my mom because she was like addicted to drugs. And I, I think I would listen to like, I would just be all sad and emo, like 13 years old. And I would, I just listen to like Linkin Park and like just really sad sounding music. But it, it like, it made me feel good because it made me feel like uh, I wasn't alone with what I was dealing with and that there were, other people kind of like taking their pain and making it into something really cool. So I think that's a, it's like a big reason why we, we do that with Dayseeker. Absolutely. I'm sorry you went through the, um, so it seems like music was a really big help for you growing up. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So how did that, um, how did listening to music like Linkin Park, like translate into when, or first of all, when did you realize that you, had this gift of singing because you're an excellent singer. So I'm interested to see whenever you were like, yeah, I could do this. Oh, thanks, man. Um, I, uh, I, I didn't for a while. I, I started playing guitar when I was like 15 and, uh, I was a lot more focused on just like playing the guitar as like, and not, not so much with like singing. And then, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I, I told the story earlier that I, I sang in front of my buddy who he kind of helped me like pick up guitar and stuff. He was also like a singer songwriter and not, not a very good singer, but um, he was a nice guy, but I think he had a weird competitive like edge in him um, in like, some type of friendly manner. But he, uh, yeah, he didn't, uh, <laughs> he was the first person I sang in front of and he like had almost no reaction, which when I was like 15, I took as like the worst thing in the world. So I feel like that kind of like, had like permanently scarred me where even now, like I don't uh, like, I don't mind singing at shows obviously, but if I have to sing, if I'm like at a party or a weird social gathering and somebody wants me to play something, I get super like turned off by it. And I get, that's I get the worst situation though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, yeah. Rory can sing dude, Roy, come over and sing. <laughs> yeah. Not, 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 not the best, the best time to do that. Um, but no, I, uh, I don't know, man. I just, I, yeah, I kind of grew up more doing like this singer songwriter thing, just like playing guitar. And I, I would just play like local, like coffee shops when I was um, like a teenager. And 
um, I just really liked doing it. I just felt like it was, I felt like I had tried other things like sports and um, just other stuff my friends did that they were really good at. And I felt like I just didn't have like a knack for anything. And then I feel like when I started learning how to play guitar, I was like, oh, like I, like I have like a natural ability, like without sounding like an asshole. But I was like, I feel like I'm like, this isn't as hard for me <clears throat> as it probably is for other people. So yeah, just kind of, I just been doing that. And I mean, I got lucky, like it's, it's worked out. It's worked out pretty well up until now. Um, I mean, it's definitely been hard at times, but um, I'm very thankful like for what I have. Yeah. That's awesome. So I find that interesting too, because, you know, as a filmmaker, I remember I tried all these things like sports and um, I had a full-time IT job at one point and I was just like, all this stuff is stupid. I just want to make videos. So is that the way it was for you? I was like, or you were like, I don't want to play these. I don't want to play sports. Like guitar is the only thing I can think about. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, def definitely. I think getting out of high school or yeah, getting out of high school. And then I, I did like, I, I went to college for a f like a few years, but like, truthfully, I never got my degree, but I got so like, uh, I got so wrapped up in like, while I was working all the time, like just at a full-time job. And then I, I joined like a band when I was 18. And I think I like, I was trying to balance like work, school and music. And I kind of was like, I'm not, I mean, not like anybody likes going to school, but I was like, man, I super don't, I like don't want to do this. Or like, there's not, there's nothing in school, but I was like, I want to work towards that. I was just like, kind of like, yeah, like I love, I love playing music and I, I feel like, I have a lot of things to say and write about. And I mean, I mean, I was like 18 at the time and I'm, I'm 31 now. So it's been like 13 years, which is pretty crazy. But um, yeah, I definitely, I think I hit a point around when I was like 20, I, I like stopped going to like college and I was like, I think I'm going to like attempt to do something with music. And I mean, it's still, it's still not in a point where like, it's like self-sustaining where I don't have to work a job. Although I, I think if the pandemic gave me a taste of what it would be like just to be a musician and not work a job, I would, I would go insane. So I'm kind of like, I'm okay with having a job when I'm home and I, um, I enjoy my work, but for sure music has been kind of, um, on more of a successful path recently. And I, I think about, I think about like people who are like, kind of like, Oh, like you should stop like it's like a childish dream or like oh like it because it is it feels weird sometimes being like yeah i'm in a band and i'm like kind of in my 30s you know but uh it's, but it really has like uh financially there have been times where it's been like it's been hard and i know like especially recently it's like with like the pandemic and stuff it's like kept my head above water like because i would like i opted to do music over a lot of these things and so i'm very like I said, I'm just, I'm very grateful and I'm, I'm very thankful that it's, it's worked out how it has, but it for sure took like a while to get to this point. <laughs> so here's a two-parter question. First of all, do you see, do you think we'll be able to go to concerts anytime soon? And to like, as soon as they announce concerts are a go, are you going to like hit the ground running and be like, all right, we got to play a show right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I guess, yeah, for your first question, I guess defined soon uh because i well my yeah my manager had basically told me he had told me months ago he's like there's no way anybody's going to be able to play shows at all until we have a vaccine so mm -hmm. the fact that there is a vaccine now which is like kind of a blessing it's like it's like a little sketchy but i'm also kind of like it's fine i'll just like i'll i'll get autism if it means i can go back to playing shows you know <laughs> I don't I'm just like I don't I don't care like I, I really want to go back to, to playing music but um no I like, think that there's going to be a anti-vaxxer protest rally in front of every day seeker show now yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah no I yeah I'm super no I'm, I'm open to taking it I, I understand people's apprehension but I'm also mm -hmm. just like I'm I'm tired of like I'm tired of this lifestyle and this thing just like yeah and I mean especially for us because it felt like we were like really at a peak in our like career and then this just like really halted it so um i just don't want to be like 40 by the time shows are a thing and then be like i'm too old like i don't i don't want to play shows anymore um so you think 40 will be too old for you oh man i don't know it's a weird thing i i used to think like 30 was was too old to like still be doing the band thing but like i don't but i don't feel like that old so i'm like i'm just, I'm just gonna keep doing it till i feel 
like I don't want to anymore. It feels ridiculous that I'm still doing it. Um, but yeah, so I, I hope we'll have shows soon. I think a lot of the people I talk to tell me they think summer is like probably the absolute soonest, if not probably more like the fall, which is like crazy because that's still like six or nine months away. And we, we haven't we haven't played a show since uh, March of this year. So it's already been about nine months. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean yeah i'll play a show the second that it's safe and it's okay i mean you also have to kind of be careful though that you're not you're not doing it in a way that it comes across like you're you're being like irresponsible or you're you're disregarding like people's safety because i yeah i have a buddy who's a promoter and he's he's an amazing guy like always takes care of us but he yeah he like he tried to put on shows in like the midwest um and it, the dude was just getting raked over the coals on social media. And I didn't particularly agree because I was like, yeah, that was a dumb idea. I probably shouldn't have done that. But he really is. <laughs> I know I know he has a good heart and his, everything was in the right space. But yeah, for sure. Like you can, if you, if you're responsible for putting an event together and it causes people to get sick, like, you know, and it's, it's just so like, to some degree, it's, it's for like your own vein too. Like, oh, like you have to play a show. Like you have to kill people like to play a show. So I, I definitely want to do it when it's safe, but I'm sure like, I'm sure this second it's okay. Like we'll have some type of show or tour announced, but I hope that's like, I hope that's 2021 at some point. Cause man, I get these like nightmare scenarios where I'm like, Oh my God, what if I like don't get to play a show until like 2023 20, or something just like years from now, you know, knows? I'm trying to be optimistic and say that that will not happen. <laughs> yeah. I really hope so, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would. I'd, I'd be so sad if I had to wait. Another what are, week. what are some things that you, you find yourself missing about the tour life? Man, everything I, I dream about. I just dreamt about, I dreamt about being, I dream about playing shows with like, like post pandemic, which is funny. Cause like people are wearing masks in my dream and the crowd and stuff. Um, I don't know, man. It's, bad. it's creeped into our dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's it's just a really cool thing to get to like kind of do what you love um just for like four or six weeks straight i feel like you you make friends with all the bands i feel like i always meet like really good people after after we play um and it's kind of a blessing and a curse because they usually have very heavy stuff to talk about and I, I have a lot of like empathy for people so sometimes by the end of a tour usually i'm like i'm kind of wiped emotionally because i'm just like I'm like yeah like i love and i appreciate these people but it it is hard to just talk about like rape and like drug addictions and death and cancer and relationships just for like like six weeks straight <laughs> just like mm -hmm. not and not like take on um you know the weight of their emotions but um i love everything about it I, honestly i kind of just miss hanging out with the guys in my band for like a month at a time it's just uh it's a good group of guys it's always just very funny and, and laid back anytime we, we hang out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've been in a couple of bands, right? This isn't your first rodeo. No. So, <laughs> yeah. um, what's like, what's the secret to having like good chemistry and just cause you know, it's easy to get annoyed by someone, but you know, you guys are out on the road for months at a time. So <laughs> what's the secret behind, you know, not wanting to kill each other? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I think, I, I think that all is actually dependent on the person. And I think mm -hmm. there's like, I mean, I'm not like openly shit talking any of like our past members specifically. Cause I, I still think everybody who's played in our band has been like a very good person, but there, there were for sure personality conflicts. Um, and just, I think, yeah, I think the important thing is like, is, um, is their general attitude, which is like something you don't really get to focus on too much until you actually hang out with them for like more than a couple hours at a time. Cause there were guys where I was like, I fucking love that guy. And then we were out for like a week or two and I was like, Oh man, he's like really negative. Actually. I like didn't realize like how much of a bummer he kind of is to be around. Like, and I think touring is already really hard. Like you're, it's a lot of sleep deprivation. Um, it's a lot of sometimes like maybe a show doesn't go well. Um, just like, I don't know. Yeah. There, there's a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. Um, and I think you, you value people that you, you bring into your group who 
can like even because there's for sure people like our our bassist is like our newest member i mean he, even so he's been with us like two or three years but i was like a little worried about adding somebody into the dynamic because everything seemed good with him not in the group before he joined and then he was so funny and he was so like he was so laid back and so cool and i feel like there were a lot of situations on tour where like our van would break down or like somebody would break in and steal just like situations where we could be in a horrible mood and he would be very just like funny or uplifting and so i i value people like that and i think yeah we've definitely played with people on the opposite end where i think like they were more concerned with like like touring for them was like an excuse to like party or hook up with girls and i i think I think what I enjoy now about everybody that we we have in the group currently is like we all kind of just want to we just want to like go play and put on as good of a show as we can and nobody really like abuses alcohol or or really cares about a lot of that other stuff and we just want to be like nice people and just play music because we like to do it so but I mean it took a minute we had to you know we had to replace a few people and 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 kick a few people out to get here but I'm, I'm really happy with everybody right now. Yeah. I was going to bring this up. Um, so actually the way that I discovered Dayseeker was, um, I remember seeing an article about you guys getting your van broken to, into, and you had all your gear stolen. Yeah. I, that's how I checked you guys out. So can you tell me more about that experience and what happened? That was horrible. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I very foolishly, I temporarily had the keys to our van um, in my car in like my personal car and they broke into my car and then very shortly after found the keys to the van and then just walked around, you know, just like setting the clicker off until they found the van. And then they took the van and the van had like, I mean, it had like the keys to the van, it had the keys to the trailer on the back, like with all of our equipment in it. And so, yeah, that was, I think that happened around Christmas actually. Oh, no. <laughs> crazy. Horrible, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes the van would get towed by the complex that I lived at. So I initially was like, oh, shit, they like, like, fuck, they towed it again. And then I, I remember I was going to work, though, and it was like really, or it was like six in the morning. And I was like, there's no way they like, they would have, like, they, they wouldn't get up this early to like tow. And then I, I like called the police, and, like, just to be like, do, like, do you have this license plate for records of towing? And they're like, no, nothing's been towed. And then yeah, I had to file a report. Um, and we just got a, we got kind of lucky. I mean, to some degree, um, they found like, they found the trailer first, um, but it was empty. So there was no equipment in it. And then, uh, and then they found the van like a month later. Um, and the van was just like thrashed, like homeless people were living in it and they had like driven it through like an orchard and had like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like dented the van. And then they were like spray painting the windows from the inside. Cause they were trying to like black it out. It was just a very like, yeah, it was kind of, yeah, we did like a GoFundMe, and I, cause I remember being like, Oh my God, like a, a new van is like 40 grand and our, like all our collective equipment is like another 30 or 40 grand and just being like, we're like eighty thousand dollars in the red right now like and we got so we got really lucky because like the finding the van and the trailer um i think we raced around like like thirty thousand i think with our we did a gofundme and we were lucky that it like just barely covered um like basically repairing everything that was wrong with the van as far as like the body work goes and then like replacing the equipment that was lost like i remember like down to like within a few hundred dollars we did just like just barely enough to like um fix the van and get all and like repay for like all brand new equipment so it was uh it was kind of a nightmare it was kind of it was wild too because i remember we were like because that that actually happened a year ago and we were trying to get everything ready for the the we came as romans tour which was in march of this year and because we had to we had like a sleeping setup in our van that was like custom made and, and they like took that out somehow. I have no, it was like, it was like a steel structure that was like bolted to the bottom of the van and they somehow like took it out. When, like when we found it, I was like, I can't believe they took that out. That's wild. Um, so I had to like, 
yeah it was just it was like down to man like down to the day to the wire um to the penny had like gotten everything it felt kind of like triumphant because we got everything done by the time we had to do the we came as romans tour and then we were out for like six days and then and then they, and then COVID happened they were like all right just go home like you can't play shows anymore so um man. yeah so kind of wild but i mean we're lucky though that we had the the support that we did because my our managers even told us too, they were like, this is like a situation that would just like kill some bands. Like financially, you just couldn't recover. And the only answer would be to like, just stop playing. So we got, yeah, we got lucky that we found some things, but I mean, it's crazy. We like never found any of our like equipment anywhere. And we, we were scanning Craigslist and let go and offer up for like months and just like never found anybody's kit. <laughs> hey, I would like to buy yeah. this guitar. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there was, yeah, there was weird things too, where we found, uh, oh man, yeah, we found a guy, we found a, yeah, we thought we had like found the guy who stole the van a few times, because we like, we found a guy on Craigslist, he was just selling the seats for the van, um, and I remember we had like, I think we were like, oh, like, the, those were the only bench seats left, it was a weird setup, where I was like, the, like, those are, it's the same color, and, and, like, those are the only bench seats that were left after we put the sleeping thing in, so I was like, and it just happened to be in, like, the same city that they found our trailer in, so I was like, I think that could be the guy, but it what was. Where were you in when it happened? Uh, I was in a city called Fullerton, um, it's near, like, Orange County in California, and mm-hmm. they ended up finding the van in the trailer, it was like an hour and a half north in some city called Ventura, which is more like LA County. So they, yeah, they, I mean, they just basically hit the jackpot. They like got the keys for everything. And I was like, yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not a great time in my life, but uh, I mean, I'm, th- I'm thankful we, we dug ourselves out of it. Cause that, that was a, that was a nightmare for a little bit. Yeah. I try to, I remember when I read that, I was like, I can't imagine having all my camera gear stolen. I was like, my career would be over. I have yeah. no idea what I would do. <laughs> but the difference between me and you is you have <laughs> very supportive fans. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, we're super lucky. Like I said, yeah. there's a lot of situations where I think some bands in our position would have just broken up. And that's like, mm. it's, heart, yeah, it's heartbreaking for them, kind of. I'm even like, like man, how do you have the... I think even if I was in their position and I was like, oh shit, I have the keys, I would be like, because initially they were just trying to get into my car and just take mm-hmm. whatever they had. I'm like, I get, I kind of get, I mean, I don't get that, but I'm like, I understand it's, it's just a whole other thing to being like, let's do Grand Theft Auto tonight <laughs> on top of it. Like, I feel like that's just a whole other thing to, to like steal a car. And then mm-hmm. obviously like, must have had some i don't know some inclination that it was like for music or there was like a guitar amp in my car that they took and so i was like come on like but i mean yeah just pre- pretty pretty heartless pretty ruthless people to just it sounds like, like that's their job that's probably what they do yeah because that's a lot of work to mm-hmm. sell all that stuff i know i yeah and it's it's still man it's so strange i was so sure that we were gonna Cause my drummer's kit was like this, this custom truth kit with like this, I think it was like a birchwood like skin coloring. And I was like, it would just be so easy to find, um, like just from pictures on the lineup and like, man, we, yeah, we checked like pawn shops, like just like everything for like months. And then at some point I was just like, I don't have the energy to look through Craigslist every day for like to try and catch these people and mm. and yeah like I said we got lucky we raised like just enough money to to like pay for everything that was that was stolen so yeah got super lucky well glad you guys came out because then I probably wouldn't be listening to Heartwave or anything else <laughs> yeah thanks man yeah so I want to talk to you about album artwork because one of the most striking features of the day of the Sleep Talk album mm. besides it just being a good record is the just the design of it. It's so like, it just gives me good vibes and it like tells me like, okay, we're going to sit down and listen to some good music. So who, uh, who designed that? And did you have anything to do with it? Or did you just kind of tell the designer what you were looking for? Um, not like I wasn't like put a girl in a bathtub and you know, like I, you know, <laughs> I, it, it doesn't usually get that. In depth. There's, there's for sure like color palettes that we had in mind. I think like, I think like a lot of our like earlier albums had like really typical like metal black like 
just like dark artwork and i think we were kind of just like uh we don't want to even if it is like a heavier record we just we we like we just want to do something that's like the opposite of what people would expect from this genre so we like kind of did it on our third record it was like it was like it was like a some some form of art where like you mix oil with like paint um like acrylic paint and then like the chemicals react and the photographers just took pictures so there's kind of like this swirly pink guy that's like our third that was like our second to last album and then sleep talk is uh we uh we met this girl her name's caitlin dargan uh she is she is dating uh one of my good friends garrett russell who's in silent planet and uh he kind of referred her to us for we had a single called crooked soul and uh we kind of it, it was like kind of quick where it was like oh hey we need like album artwork because it like it, i remember it was like a really fast like this song has to come out when we were we were on a tour i think with the plot and you and they were like it has to come out on this tour and we were like oh shit so we we hit her up and yeah she had this like stock image of her with like a disco ball kind of thing and it, it just it was like kind of a I just think like she nailed the aesthetic so well for the first single that we were like, you like, do you want to do <laughs> like, like everything for sleep talk? And so, so she, uh, she's the girl we, in the music video as well. She is. Yeah. We kind of, that was such a, like a random thing that almost didn't happen either. Cause she lives in Florida. So we, we filmed the music video in like orange County in LA and we had to like fly her out. Um, yeah, she like almost wasn't going to be a thing, but then, uh, I'm I'm happy she came and yeah she's been like uh yeah she's been the face of a lot of our stuff she yeah she killed it for sleep talk so she's honestly she's done everything for uh for hurt wave too like all of the same thing what we have like a single called my father said with this girl with like an umbrella and it's like still her and yeah, oh it's I mean, her too <laughs> yeah yeah no <laughs> she's a like, cinematic universe <laughs> yeah yeah no she just uh she just she just does it she i think she just captures like a vibe really well and um i just yeah i have a lot of love for her as a person and as an artist and so yeah i think she i think she just gets what we're trying to do so um a lot of it honestly is i think we were kind of just like oh this it's kind of an 80s vibe so if you can do like just like some neon type coloring for whatever you do for the cover so i think that's where like maybe some of like these like kind of blues and purples came into play um when she was making it but the i mean she sent a few variants through for for the album cover but i think just it, yeah it was like her in the bathtub and it was kind of a it was weird because she has the disco ball as well and it, it wasn't intentional but like we've always had like sometimes like a crescent moon mm -hmm. logo for us and it was like it seemed like a sign from god because i think i think the light is like refracting off of the disco ball in a way where it looks like there's a there's like a crescent D that's reflecting off the wall. And we were like, Oh, did you like, like, did you do that on purpose? And she was like, no, it just like, it just happened like that when I was taking the photo and we were like, Oh, cool. I think that's like, that's probably the one. So yeah, I can't, I can't take too much credit. It's, it's mostly her brain for like the imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As Bob Ross would say, happy little accidents. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we, we've actually gotten some people commenting over here. So I thought we'd go over that real quick. So, Oh, cool. Uh, Nick Sully, I think that's how you say your name. Sad music over happy music any day. So I think uh, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> I, know, I know Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nikki is, uh, she's a, I met her actually on tour, like our, like our first tour ever. Um, it was oh, like, nice. I think it was like in Little Rock, Arkansas, like seven years ago. But um, yeah, she's a great friend and she's, she's actually a, a really talented singer and a really, a really sweet person. But yeah, I know. I know she likes the sad music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, thanks for hopping in the comments, Nikki. Yeah. Um, BAG217 said, Sleep Talk is the best album I've heard in a while. Absolutely amazing. I can agree with that. I love that album. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, last one is, when can we expect new music? Um, I, well, well, Hurt Wave, I guess we'll, we'll be putting out singles until... Um, we have three more and I know the newest one comes out this Thursday. We somehow got really lucky that I, I wrote a song about new year's Eve and then we were like, Oh cool. Like new year's Eve is like right around the time we have to put a song out. So we're like, we might as well put it out mm -hmm. New Year's Eve on new year's Eve. So yeah, that'll come out on Thursday. Um, and then we have, we have two more after that. So we'll probably space it out like another seven weeks. So there's a song, we, sh we shot a music video for a song called black and blue. That one comes out 
probably in like February. And then we have another, our last song on the EP is called Overdose and that'll be out in like March or April um, mm-hmm. but I mean, for Dayseeker. But then it's good timing because I'm, I'm actually going in next week to start working on like, uh, like reimagined versions of like Dayseeker stuff for Sleep Talk. So, um, so that'll, so the good thing is like probably when Hurt Wave is just about done putting out all the music that we have, we'll probably announce like a deluxe version of Sleep Talk for for Dayseeker, and then, nice. and then we're uh, yeah, and then we're we're kind of like in the beginning stages of writing our next album. So we have like a few few demos we're working with, but we're uh, I think we'll have like new new music probably out in like fall or like late like twenty twenty one basically. So mm-hmm. yeah, trying to trying to stay busy, you know. That's awesome. So what is your songwriting process like? Cause I love your lyrics are super intricate. And so what is, uh, what kind of like puts you in the mood or gives you inspiration? Um, it just depends. I, so, sometimes like I'll think about, uh, like, yeah, I had like a bad run in musically with this guy. I think that's what I'm going to write the next day seeker song about. It's like, it's like a little different. Cause I don't think it's going to be as much as it is sad as more as it is like, fuck you, man. Um, but like kind of in a, a more like a more, like a more poetic way, I guess. Um, yeah, I just, I helped this guy musically and we, we kind of had like a bad falling out and I, and then he wrote a song about how much he like hated me. And then, so I was like, okay, I guess I'll, I guess I'll return fire, so to speak. Um, so, so anyway, those are like, those are, uh, you know, those are things where I'm like, oh man, like, I, I guess that would be like something cool to try and write about at some point. Um, but then there's times like, like we have a song uh, with Hurt Wave called My Father Said, and that was like, that was like not um, meant to be like a, like a song with Hurt Wave. Like I just, I happened, we were only going to do six songs and then I happened to get really, really bummed out one night. And, and then uh, I just kind of like, it's just, yeah, I wrote, I wrote like My Father Said in like, like three or four hours. Cause I just, and I wasn't doing it with like the intention of like, I have to write like there's a deadline or like I have to write for the EP. I was just kind of like, man, I'm like, I am in it. And, uh, I think this is, I don't know. It just like, it kind of just poured out. I just started writing these lines down. And then I was like, Oh man, I like really like this. And then I, we like a vocoder effect at the beginning of that song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We kind of, it just seemed to fit kind of, that vibe and i mean yeah the, the the vocoder is a super cool kind of newer thing we've been experimenting with but yeah um i guess it kind of just depends sometimes yeah sometimes i'll keep things like kind of tucked away in my head or i'm like i like i really want to write about that topic at some point and then other times it's like it's like man i i'm like deep in my emotions right now and it'll it'll probably come out a lot cooler if i just sit down and like get this out right now um instead mm-hmm. of like waiting to to write about it months down the line. That's awesome. And mm-hmm. something I kind of touched on earlier was uh, creating atmosphere. And I think that's what Dayseeker and Hurtwave does really well. So what what's like the secret sauce that you put behind it? Is it the synths or uh, what do you do to create like a, just songs that you feel like you could jump into? Yeah, it's funny. There's, there's kind of a formula where we always find like a, you find like a, uh, we will we'll always usually with our producer, Daniel, we'll find like a singular background layer that goes like literally most of the song, like the entire time. Like in, we had a song called burial plot where I had this guitar thing and it was just like, dah, nah, 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 nah. and it was like on clean, but he just like, we basically just like covered a lot of it in like reverb and kind of EQ'd it in a really interesting way. And then it's just this, like, it literally goes like the entire song, but it's just kind of tucked in the back. So it's like, yeah, just kind of creating a vibe. And then sometimes we'll even do like a, a second layer over that. Um, just to kind of, it again, just kind of creates like an atmosphere. And then he yeah, has like a, he has like this bass synth pad that we use. He calls it a fuck boy bass. Uh, <laughs> see, I think he used it for a lot of like, like R and B or like trap like stuff, but it like goes really well over this genre. And then just like some pads and some keyboards and I'll have like some guitar stuff. I don't know. It always, it always just kind of comes together. The, the bigger problem honestly is like, we were kind of like 
like S- sever our first single for hurt wave um was called sever and we actually we had a version because that song had been recorded for like three or four years and we had a version that we sat on for a while and then we were kind of like like man there's like so much shit going on like we kind of had to like that's that was our smaller issue in the past was we would like add too much stuff and it would just sound like chaos so on the the version of sever that ended up coming out we actually took away like a couple synthesizer layers and other stuff to like make it a little clearer but um we try and be smart about it but it's yeah a lot of it's just due to our producer he's just he's the shit i can't i can't say enough good things about him he really does just have like a great mind for writing and like soundscapes for music Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, next thing i want to talk about is uh your singing ability um I think you have a very unique voice. I feel like it's a blend of a lot of different musicians. Am I correct on that? Or did you, did your style like come as soon as you started like singing yourself? Um, yeah, it's, well, yeah, it's funny because I think when I was like a teenager, I just, I wanted to be like, uh, like Aaron Gillespie from under Oak. So I was like, this dude, this dude just like wails. He's just like belting. But then, uh, but then, uh, yeah, I mean, I know the guy. I know the guy is like kind of not an awesome person, but then I heard like people like Johnny Craig or like or like Tyler Carter, where I was like, oh man, there's like, there's like soul in like post hardcore now, and it's kind of nice. And so I got a lot more like that, and I feel like that led like me into listening to like a lot of R and B, and then um, yeah, and like more recently over the last few years, it's not it's not really something I like intentionally aimed to like tackle or do, but I think. I just kind of started getting like more of a natural like grit with my singing sometimes. And then I got kind of more into like that pitched kind of yell, like sort of thing that like architects or like bring me the horizon does. So yeah, I try and have like a good, a good mix between all those things. I wouldn't say that it was ever like, like entirely like intentional. It just kind of happened that way as I got older, but I appreciate that though, man. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, how do you control your voice whenever you're like on tour? Cause I feel I listen to you and I'm like, dang, like he can hit these high notes. He can scream. Like, are you not like dead after every show? <laughs> and uh, you talk to fans after every show. I do. Yeah. The, the talking thing is, is like almost worse than, uh, <laughs> it's almost worse than performing. Cause <laughs> like, you're like, you're like trying to, you're like kind of trying to yell in somebody's ear over like the mm-hmm. band playing or like loud, loud house music um, versus I kind of, yeah, I mean, when we first started touring, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't going that smoothly for me. I was, I was losing my voice a lot. And cause, cause I mean, at home, when you play a single show, you can just like, you can just wail and just go like way too hard on your voice. And then if it's like a little, if you're like a little sore of an exit, it's like, you don't have to do it again for like another month or a couple months. Um, definitely like when you get into the touring world, it's like a, you got to figure out how to do that same thing over and over again and so i got a lot more into like i did like one vocal lesson um a long time ago and i didn't take a ton away from it but he did teach me kind of this thing called a speech level singing and it it basically just teaches you the theory that like i used to like think when you have to sing like really big powerful stuff you have to like exert a lot of like energy and oxygen and it's it's just like not the truth so it's like um, it's just a lot of breath support and you, I think actively touring had kind of like shown me how to, how to sing like these big notes. And I like, don't need to really use a lot of effort or energy. And like, I would, I'd be screwed if I, if I didn't really kind of get that technique down. Cause there's, there's songs like, uh, like, the, yeah, I mean, a lot of the songs are like, they're pretty big vocally, but I remember like burial plot is a song off sleep talk and that's pretty like the whole time we're playing it it's just like it's it's just going and it's just a lot of big belty stuff and i think Mm -hmm. like i if i didn't know how to kind of do that that way of singing where it's just like more relaxed and chilled out i like wouldn't i would lose oxygen and i i'd I'd be like screwing the song up like a minute or two in so it's a lot it's a lot of practice we've we've been touring like seven years or so and i I think i I have a pretty a pretty okay lock on it now but it it was not going that great uh in the beginning i watched your live i watched your live performance of drunk recently Mm -hmm. and uh, i think you guys put that out a couple days ago i think and uh pretty pretty recently yeah yeah um 
uh, I was like, dang, you go even harder in the live performance than in the recording whenever you go, where can you and like, yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, dang. He goes harder yeah. in the live version. <laughs> well, it's easier in the studio. You can just kind of, mm. you just chilled out. And I, I think that's the harder thing. That's the harder thing, if anything, is like not letting your, uh, not letting like your adrenaline get the best of you. Because there's times mm-hmm. where we go out and like, there'd be like a lot of people or just like a great crowd and I'd be getting too into it. And I could feel that I I'd be like pushing like a lot harder vocally than I had to. So that's, that's the bigger challenge when we're in a studio. It's so like, you're just going part by part and it's, it's so mellow. It's like, it's, yeah, it's a lot easier to kind of go harder live for sure. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. right. What's some, what's some advice that you could give to, um, you know, artists, um, whether you're a musician, a filmmaker, a painter, or anything like what, what would be your advice for, you know, dipping your toes into, you know, just putting content out there and just putting yourself out there? Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, if you're working with like a band or a team or a manager, just like anybody that you're going to bring into your art, just make sure that they have good, good or similar intentions to you. Like, it, it was kind of going back to what I was saying where like, you know, we had guys in our group where I think they saw touring as like more of an opportunity to party. And now I feel like everybody's like on the same page. Um, so yeah, just to like keep good people on your team. Cause there's a lot of people, I mean, especially in music, there's a lot of people you'll meet like managers and labels who are telling you all these great things they're going to do for you. And they're just totally full of shit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just have good people on your team uh, and in your corner And I think the bigger thing too, I mean, again, probably related more to music, but I guess it could translate to anything. It's just not to really like go cheap on, um, if you, there's kind of that like whole dynamic of like fake it till you make it. And so you have to, you got to pay for the right person to do your recordings. You have to pay for the right person to do your videos. Cause I mean, I've, I've heard songs and seen things in art where like the idea was great but they they took a very cheap alternative and like i've heard it where i'm even like man like that song's awesome but whoever recorded it did such a bad job like i can't i can't even listen to it um or like the video just looks like it was shot for like a couple hundred dollars even though it's like a a great song so i would say to definitely you have to invest for sure and yeah we kind of that was kind of what we were told in the beginning of day seeker was like just fake it till you make it like we did a live video at this, like, it's like a 300 cap club and it was like packed out and it looks like the craziest show, but you know, like it's just like a small like venue and it was fun, but like, you know, it's funny how, like, I think those things can create this vibe, like, whoa, they're like a bigger deal than they actually are. But I feel like it makes more people want to check your band out and like kind of care yeah. about who you are. But yeah, I guess those are my only things really. Yeah. Mm. And uh, speaking of music videos, you guys just hit 2 million views on Sleep Talk. Congratulations. I saw. Thanks, man. That's uh, that's pretty wild. We didn't I, I didn't I didn't think that song was going to do as well as it did. So I'm uh, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. That's for sure. So wait, you mean to tell me when you finished recording that you were like, it's it'll probably do OK. Like you didn't expect it would do that well. No, not at all. Um, we, <laughs> we, honestly, yeah, because that's kind of a. That's a funny thing I was having a conversation about earlier too. Is like music is kind of scary in the sense that, um, like myself as an artist, like I like I want to love it. I want to think it's good, but like it's uh, it's kind of like it doesn't always mean that it is. Like we had an album before Sleep Talk that I thought was like the shit, and I thought it was such a good album. And then looking back now, I'm like it wasn't that good. Like, I don't, like, it, like, I really, I mean, not that it was horrible, but like, it wasn't as good as I thought it was. And I, there, there's for sure a reason why I think commercially it didn't get uh, received as well as Sleep Talk did. But then it kind of psyched me out for Sleep Talk. Cause then I was like, well, man, I thought the last one was great. And it kind of like tanked. It didn't do very well. So I think it was, and it was hard too, because Sleep Talk was kind of like a, we kind of went into it and like knowing we were going to kind of like, lightly abandoned like the metal core vibe that we had like we were like we're just gonna be like we're just gonna sing a lot more than we ever have on any of our albums and i think we were worried that people were gonna call us sellouts or just think we were you know just like trying to i don't yeah just trying to be profitable or make but which of course kind of but i mean it was also just because that's what we were happier writing but 
sleep talk was funny because that that was kind of like my father said where like we I think we almost had enough songs for the record and it was one of the last songs we wrote and I was kind of like I just want to try something with like an 80s synth and I have this like clean guitar thing for the verse and then we we wrote that song pretty fast and I well it's funny because I wasn't like I didn't realize not in like a, a cock way I didn't realize like how good the song was until other people like told me like I remember I finished recording the vocals for it and then our producer was just like this is such a good fucking song like what and then I sent it to our manager and they were just like dude this is like a single I like I didn't even know if it was like a single I was like I don't know like it's like I think it's a good song but I didn't know it was like it was like the one you know so it's kind of a it's always interesting yeah seeing I mean because I think too like not in like a bummer way but we've we've been putting out music pretty consistently for like seven years and just got so used to like our videos just getting like a couple hundred thousand views after like them being active for like six or seven years you know so for like for sleep talk to hit a couple million in like a year and a half is like it's it's pretty wild i i didn't i didn't think it was going to do that well but i i mean that's amazing that's that's just a testament to you guys's endurance to just keep going yeah, I'm like I said, I'm very, I'm super happy and I'm very grateful. But I no, I, I was not expecting this like anything like this good to come from our last album. So it's it's a blessing for sure. Awesome, Roy, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I think we should just close out the show. Uh, first of all, is there anything else you'd like to tell the people? And then, of course, just plug everything in. Where can we find you guys? And where can we listen to the music? Buy some merch, whatever. Yeah. Um. Not a lot to plug, I guess, just to keep an eye out for Heartwave stuff. We have a, yeah, a single coming in a couple of days on December 31st. Um, we'll be putting out a couple more songs and then keep an eye out for that deluxe version of Sleep Talk. But that I probably won't be out till spring or so. But yeah, you can just check everything out. Um, just Dayseeker on all our social media. And then I think Heartwave or Heartwave Band, depending on where you're looking. But no, I um yeah, I appreciate you having me, man. Thanks, thanks so much for for the interview. It was cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody, that's that concludes our show. Hope you guys all have a blessed day, and thank you again, Rory. Thanks, man. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody.